right. Give everybody one more minute. Seems like everybody's people are joining on right as their lunch break start if they're on the East Coast. <laughs> it's like dinner time in the UK, breakfast in the West Coast. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I have 12 o'clock on my my clock. So we're going to get started here because we have a lot to talk about. So thank you everyone for joining us as, as more people kind of join on. I'm just going to do a little introduction here. Um, this is the Cons Conversations with Changemakers series, Strategies for Reducing the Energy Consumption of Buildings. Um, this is a series, um, I'm, I'm Roxy Sperber, I'm the chair of the AIC Sustainability Committee, and this is something that we've put together um, with the committee. My colleague Amy Chris is also here helping field questions, um, but this is something that we really felt um, you know, was missing from the conversation at the moment. There's a lot of conversation around different strategies for reducing energy consumption, which is fantastic. Um, shout out to uh, Caitlin at Key Culture for putting together an incredible free conference uh, at the end of last year about different strategies for um, reducing energy consumption and making, um, you know, cultural institutions more sustainable. Uh, we've also done a few Ask an Expert series ourselves, uh, which you can find on our wiki. Um, so there's, and, you know, myriad more people have been talking about this, so I don't want to, by any means, say that that's an exhaustive list. So um, it's a really exciting conversation. It's really, you know, changing things up, but we really wanted to highlight um, that there are colleagues in the field who have been doing this for many, many years and are doing it really well. This is, these strategies are not, you know, um, kind of treading in new territory. There are lots of, lots of um, wonderful colleagues who have already been implementing them. And so we really thought it would be useful to have some conversations around that and kind of um, demystify some of these strategies and uh, help all of you who are interested in helping to implement them, um, you know, kind of figure out who to talk to and where to go. So that's sort of the background. Um, Housekeeping, please enter any questions that you have. We do want this to be uh, to a degree interactive. There are a lot of you uh, in attendance, so we can't unfortunately like unmute and all talk, but if you could throw um, any questions in the Q&A and feel free to comment on questions or you know vote things up if you really want those questions answered and um, we'll do our best uh, to address those. Um, also captioning is enabled and we are recording this event. So just a heads up on all of that. Um, a little bit of, uh, preview for what's coming next with this series. We have events in March and April planned. Um, we uh, don't have all the speakers confirmed yet, but March event will be um, with colleagues in the UK. This is obviously in, in uh, collaboration with ICOM too, I should say. Uh, Lorraine Finch has been a collaborator, collaborator on this project. So um, that will be um, featured in March. And then in April, we'll be talking to some private conservators. So there's uh, a real interest, I think, from all of you who work in private conservation studios to, to be thinking about what you can do to be more sustainable. So we will be talking about that in April. So stay tuned for all of that. And this is really intended to lead up to the annual meeting um, in Jacksonville in, uh, in May. So um, all right, without further ado, let me introduce everyone. As I said, I'm Roxy. I'm the chair of the AIC Sustainability Committee. Amy, um, who's joining me as our resource, resource officer and our wonderful guest, um, Nancy Ravenel, who um, works at the Shelburne Museum in Vermont and Patricia Silence or Patty Silence, as she likes to be referred, um, who is at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation in Virginia. So um, do a little brief introduction. Um, Patty became her, began her career at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation as an exhibits conservator in 1999, following her work as a textile conservator at the Textile Conservation Lab in Lowell, Massachusetts, and an objects conservation technician at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. Um, now Patty is the Director of Conservation Operations at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Her department consists of 45 specialist conservators, technicians, and aides who work in nine media-specific and analytical labs, um, including preventative conservation. Patty works closely with a wide variety of CWF colleagues on construction projects, environmental control systems, fire protection, lighting, and integrated pest management. 
which sounds busy to me. Um, so thanks for making the time, Patty. Um, and she also works with collection colleagues all over the world to practice and promote preventative conservation. Patty is an active professional associate of AIC and currently works with Materials Working Group. And she's also the founding chair of the Green Task Force in 2008, which is now the AIC Sustainability Committee. So we are very indebted to her um, here at the uh, on the committee. Nancy Ravenel received her MS in Art Conservation from the Winterthur Museum uh, slash University of Delaware program as an objects major. Uh, she hates to admit it, but this is her 25th year at the Shelburne Museum in Vermont, where she is currently the Director of Conservation. For 17 of those years, she shared an office with Rick Kirshner, who appears to be in the audience. Thanks for joining us, Rick. Um, and who is the first conservator hired by the museum and instituted many of the energy saving policies that she's gonna describe here. So we are indebted to him as well. Um, she learned a lot through osmosis. Her office neighbors include the Museum Director of Preservation and Landscape, Buildings Preservation Team, and the Facilities Technician. And that proximity has been really helpful for building relationships and sharing observations. So that's something we're going to get into uh, today, we hope, talking about sort of how to build a team at your institution to, um, you know, really promote these uh, values and these policies um, and put all of this into action. So once again, thank you all for joining us and thank you both for being willing to share some of your uh, experience with both of your incredibly busy schedules, I'm sure. Um, so I think most of us are probably familiar with your respective institutions. I should say we kind of paired these two institutions together because they are um, larger sort of campus-wide um, multi-building institutions. Um, but I think it would be great if you could uh, each describe, you know, your campus, the types of buildings and the collections. Um, I'm going to ping pong back and forth, but we'll start with you for this one, Patty, if you could give us a little overview of the Colonial Williamsburg. Um, so Colonial Williamsburg is on 300 plus acres. We have over 600 structures. Um, the ones that I'm involved with also include 200, over 200 period rooms, um, as you might call them. Um, we've got 70,000 decorative and folk art collections, uh, 60 million architectural, or I'm sorry, archaeological pieces, um, uh, 19,000 uh, architectural fragments. And um, so it's it's big, it's broad. But we also have collections of animals and plants and you know those kinds of things that come with being a living history museum. Um, each of our buildings has a range of types of HVAC or not systems, um, anywhere from you know chillers and boilers and big powerful air handlers to um, home type um, heat pumps. We only have one exhibit building that is not air conditioned, though, that we invite the public into. So, and we're in Virginia, as, as, as Roxy said. Yes, I'm also really keen to kind of get into the climate differences between the institutions yeah. that you're talking about. <laughs> because, yeah, that's not having, yeah, air conditioning in Virginia, that must be an interesting challenge. Um, but Nancy, could you give us a little bit of a description of uh, the Shelburne Museum? Sure. So I, um, you know, Patty just mentioned they've got 600 buildings um, or so at Colonial Williamsburg. We're about a tenth of that size with um, what our um, head of preservation and landscape, Chip Stulen, likes to say. He, we've got 66 roofs at Shelburne Museum. Um, I, I don't know, I, Amy, if you want to put up the slide just to show people a little bit from above. And um, this is a, an image that um, Rick Kirshner put together um, just to show <clears throat> the, the the variety of um, kinds of systems that we are, we are using. So the the buildings at Shelburne Museum are a con combination of historic structures that were moved to campus and um, purpose built structures, which range from barns to um, full HVAC systems to things like. Um, a locomotive and the the oval shaped thing there in black is is this uh, the steamship Ticonderoga, um, which do, they don't have any HVAC systems, but they do have um, collections items or items that are not necessarily accessioned objects that we want to make sure they they stay in decent condition. 
Um, the collections themselves are wide ranging um, from impressionist paintings to American paintings dating from the um, late 1700s to two years ago. Um, we've got um, decorative arts and folk art and textiles and tools and horse-drawn vehicles and taxidermy. Um, we currently have an IMLS funded inventory of the museum's pharmaceutical collection underway. And um, I would say that some of the structures as at Colonial Williamsburg, some of our structures are accessioned um, collections objects as well. Um, so I think that's, yeah, I think uh, I just to say a little bit about the, the systems like like Colonial Williamsburg, we've got full HVAC systems to home sized systems in here. And um, we use um, a fair amount of what Rick referred to as uh, practical climate control, where the temperature in the buildings is controlled actually by the humidity level um, rather than um, comfort level uh, and thermostat. So I think that's- That's actually a really great transition. So I think um, Kelly in her webinar with us, her Ask an Ex webinar um, when she was at the IPI came on and sort of laid out six different energy saving strategies. And um, I'm guessing that not everyone, everyone should watch that webinar, but <laughs> I'm guessing probably everybody doesn't have them off the top of their head. Um, but I would love it if you guys could talk a little bit about maybe starting with you, Nancy, since you were just kind of talking about this a little bit, you know, what some of your different strategies are in the different buildings. I know with the exhaustive, um, you know, campuses that you're dealing with, you probably won't be able to name them all, but just maybe a few highlights of interesting strategies that you've taken on, um, just to name a couple that, that we have talked about for those who aren't so familiar, you know, seasonal drift, if you do have an HVAC system, uh, microclimates, shutdowns, um, you know, these different sort of strategies that some of them make our hearts stop a little bit more as people who work in museums like myself, and then others are like, Oh yeah, we've been doing that forever. So I'm just kind of curious, um, you know, what sorts of strategies you've uh, been implementing at your institutions? Well, certainly seasonal drift and and um, having set seasonal set points is is one that we use. Um, and given that we have so many different structures, we uh, one thing that we make great use of is um, making sure that the collections in a spe specific structure are appropriate to that structure. Um, so many, because the museum opened to the public um, or began in 1947 and um, had, hadn't had climate control, really, I mean, when Rick started um, in his 1992 paper that he published in um, JAIC, he makes mention that some of the buildings had ranges in relative humidity from 15% to 95%. So those collections are, are sort of proofed. They've, they've kind of experienced the worst that they can experience. And so his strategy was really to, to, to take off the, um, the, the, the top edges, top and lower edges and, and bring the, um, the relative humidity band year that things experience into a much narrower area. Um, certainly um, adding passive um, measures into into structures, making sure that the drainage around the building and then the um, is is appropriate, and that the the um, basements can be as dry as we can keep them. Um, adding insulation where we can and where it's appropriate. Um, yeah, I, all of them. I think <laughs> <laughs> all of the above. <laughs> Patty, would you like to? Okay. Um, I would say, so, you know, we have everything from these very, very old buildings that don't have any insulation and, you know, we want to keep them, the structure is as important in, as or more important than the collections that are inside because we do exactly what Nancy said, we, we wouldn't, we don't, we don't have hardly any, the only building we have textiles in is one that is interpreted in the 1940s, 50, or yeah, 40s and 50s. Um, that the Rockefellers lived in, but otherwise original textiles just aren't in our historic area. Um, but we too are taking the edges off. We're open, all of our sites are open to the public all year round. So not heating or going to 50 degrees, you know, we, we probably look at um, comfort more than 
than I would like. But um, so in the winter, we've we've had actually in-person meetings with all of our staff saying, you know, it's not going to be warmer than 67 in your building um, and, you know, dress accordingly. And that help, has helped us with the low RH issues that heat offers. But um, in the summer, it's it's pretty much we we actually are heating to 72 in the in a lot of these structures that have the um, they chill to, to dehumidify and then reheat. We recognize that we're probably heating more than we want in the summer. And yet, you know, that is energy use, but it's keeping the RH down and um, it mold. It, mold is not a sustainable um, activity in our buildings. So, so we're, we see very flat line RH all summer long. And then in the winter, it pretty much bounces wherever the heck it wants to in the, in the historic area. Um, we operate our, our um, modern buildings. We have several buildings that are post 1986 that have these very sophisticated um, chillers, boilers, the whole nine yards. And that's where we have employed shutdowns. And um, in our collections building, actually in the collections store, it's in a hyper insulated zone in the middle of the building, surrounded by offices and conservation labs. And that's where we've been able to shut down um, the HVAC 14 hours a day. And um, the first year that we did that, which might have been 15 years ago, we saved $16,000 just on that one building. So, um, you know, shutdowns <laughs> have really been our, it, well, and, and in that building, the chillers, the boilers for three other very, very large buildings are incorporated. So we don't shut everything down. This is just air handlers. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's fantastic. Sorry, I'm yeah. like, 15 years you've been doing this. That's amazing. Yeah. The other strategy, though, that I wanted to bring up is it's really important to support your facilities people in keeping all of the equipment super well tuned. And, um, you know, so that I, I think that saves as much as anything to really keep an eye on how things are running and um, and not, you know, be economical in the way the building runs. So, yeah, so it sounds like these different strategies are tailored very carefully um, to the different spaces, which is fantastic. Um, I'm curious what sort of prompted these conversations to begin with. Uh, Nancy, you sort of mentioned this going back to maybe like the 90s, um, but I, I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, I think of this as, as I don't know, I've been in the field maybe 10 years. Um, it's sort of like a new conversation, but it obviously isn't. And this conversation has been going on. It's, you know, maybe started as like advocating for more HVAC, more stable conditions. And now we're sort of saying like, oh, wait, we're, you know, the climate crisis is upon us. Um, so I'm just very curious, you know, how you two see this conversation, where it started, how it's evolved. Um, and if you could speak to that a little bit, if there are sort of lessons in that uh, for us. Um, let's start with you, Nancy. So, so for us, I think um, actually, I think I've I've seen conversations around energy usage and the cost of energy usage in our archives dating back to the 1960s. And in Vermont, I don't know a Vermonter who isn't focused on energy costs, frankly. And I think there's a wide range of um, heating and cooling options that are employed domestically. Um, in the state, um, every, you know, people still heat their homes with wood up here um, or pellet stoves. And um, so again, the, it, but it was really um, influenced by by fiscal constraints and, and concerns over how much all this energy is costing. And the, the co correspondence that I saw in the 1960s is that the museum was building a new building and um, they had calculated how much water usage and energy usage was going to be um, this this would create and um, they just the town said well, no that's not sustainable and so they had to um, come up with other ways of of heating and um, and, uh, and and controlling light in that building um, so and when Rick Kirshner started you know still the museum was concerned about how much it all costs and so obviously you'll see in his writing that there is um, a lot of focus on costs. I think now the conversation has pivoted to you know how we're seeing 
issues related to climate change, that it, our summers are much warmer than they were when Rick and, and Ernie Conrad and the other um, folks who were involved in designing our systems were putting them together. And so we are challenged with um, our systems operating in a, a new climate environment. And so that's where we're shifting to. I think the only thing to add is that um, the museum also um, added two solar fields. And so electrical use is um, predominantly covered by those solar fields. And so that's that's changed the conversation slightly, but I think we're still um, awfully concerned about our energy usage and and um, how we run the, the systems. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, I think. Well, Patty, what was, what's your answer to that? <laughs> no, um, yeah, all the same. I mean, um, energy use really does reflect in, in the, the bills that we have to pay. Um, I will say that we, CW is big enough that um, they really pride themselves on doing what's best for the collection. And so I am afraid that some of the arguments for, you know, super tight, and you know, in the 1980s, um, we put in systems that that right now, um, you know, I I regret. I don't think anybody questions that they should be that kind of a system, but um, we are coming on to you know they are aging out, and so every conversation on on replacing them does revolve around you know not too big, not too small, you know, just right, and then how do we maximize it and um, our conversations about what's best for the collection have had to um, to shift to say, no, 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 you're not doing a poor job if this isn't a super tight system. And, you know, to to our guys credit in the facilities department and, and our engineering people, they um, they take it very seriously. And so it's been an education process to say, you know, just it, it's OK, we can we can relax a bit. It doesn't need to be so tight. And, um, you know, we have a lot of experience with witnessing damage and, and or with not witnessing damage. You know, we have our extremes. We know what we can tolerate and what we can't. So that is um, actually, but I, oh, sorry, yeah, the money is important. The, um, the collection care is important, but also, um, you know, just being able to keep <laughs> not make things so complicated that it requires all these specialists as well, because that's a that's a fiscal issue as well. Mm. That's actually a perfect transition. So I think you really hit the nail on the head when you when you sort of addressed that, um, you know, the 1980s and that you regret that I would I would love to hear more about why and also where you go when you assess your risk. Like this is the thing that for me as a, you know, younger conservator, I guess. I'm like, I'm kind of meat career now, but um, I kind of think to myself, you know, I don't have the institutional knowledge of decades. I don't, you know, I, I get nervous that if I say, let's loosen these parameters, um, how, you know, where do I start looking? Are you recording everything? Like sort of how are you, how are you going about having the um, chutzpah to, to kind of say, okay, actually we can relax. We don't need to um, be quite so careful. I'll start with you, Patty, since you- since It does you take time. I mean, it does, It there are benefits to age <laughs> and experience where you, you kind of know the sky will not fall, um, you know, and I think being taught as conservators that, you know, any damage is bad. I, you really have to start thinking about change will occur to this object over time. How do we extend that length of time? How do we- use it though for what it's for which is you know education and experience and you know our understanding our culture and cultures um so you know i think changing some of those conversations about we're not looking at you know 700 years we might be looking at three and you know what's total damage i mean these these are these are conversations we have light is our is the lights the the one you know it's it's not environment and i think if you really stop and you can witness in your lifetime that damage from um light but you might not from 
environment. You know, dirt and light are probably more damaging to collections than the environment generally, right? You've got these rare, extraordinary things, and those are the ones you will look out for and you learn what they are. And I think looking at images from the past is really helpful in assessing um, what kind of damage or what kind of change has happened over the years. Um, I think for me, that's been the most, um, that has put my mind to ease most. Where I get a little nervous is when something new has been acquired and the curator wants to put it in one of the historic houses, which has that wide range. And I don't really know how that object will respond to that environment. Um, and I just watch, I watch it really carefully. And if something needs to move, it needs to move. That and the recently conserved. If something gets glued up, a wooden thing gets glued up, that's what's going to pop. Um, yeah. so. and, and in fact, in my treatment work, I often make my material choices based on right. the environment, but that also comes with, you know, several decades of putting objects in, <laughs> treated objects into environments that um, are not what we typically think of to put them into and knowing how those materials will re respond. So do you treat, you know, those two examples that you gave, maybe a recently conserved object or a recently acquired object, do you treat those differently? Do you have a more sort of regimented monitoring program or do you tend to put them in different environments? I mean, it sounds like you're putting them into the environment they're going to go in and then reacting accordingly, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, Nancy, you brought that I, up. I, I think that that's it, is that I'm just monitoring it a little bit more carefully okay. and make a point to go check on that thing. Mm -hmm. um, when I do my rounds collecting data. Gotcha. Um, cool. Super. Um, and so, I mean, you two are fond of knowledge about this and sounds like you've learned from really uh, great colleagues as well. But I'm curious if you involved any outside experts in terms of doing energy audits, like is that something that's routinely done? Um, there's some wonderful colleagues in the field who I know are experts in this that I've often thought to call on. So I'm curious if that's part of um, the implementation of these um, strategies. I think it's really helpful. Um, you know, outsiders are always listened to a little bit better than insiders and that, you know, it brings you, you know, these ideas and these thoughts. Um, so getting, you know, NEH or, or IMLS grants is a, a really great way to get those people in. And that's, that's what we've done. Um, we've also cooperated with um, IPI on some of their, um, their work with libraries. We had a library that met the requirements for a for one of their projects and so they they came and advised kelly and 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 chris and and um jeremy all came and worked with us on that um i will i one cautionary tale at one point we had an administrator who brought in an energy saving company and um i can say with confidence that they did more harm than good they mm -hmm. They decreed that certain sites should have shutdowns and started um, just doing things without talking with us, without understanding what um, conservation and even without consulting facilities management's expertise. And um, that was that was not a good project. You really want somebody that is going to listen to you and and be open. So. Yeah, and I see that Rick Kirshner in the chat make, made mention of Efficiency Vermont, and they have been really helpful to Shelburne Museum, not only to provide um, the financial incentives, but also advice. Um, right now, we're in conversations with them again about um, how the best ways or, or suggesting um, how we might do a better job of, 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 of tracking our energy usage in various buildings. Um, they've been a, a wonderful, wonderful resource for us to draw on. The difference is, is that they, it's a conversation. It's not them coming in and, and making changes. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And is there, I guess, I guess this is probably a question that, that um, is going to be dependent on different spaces, but I'm wondering if there's sort of one uh, go-to strategy that you, that you like over the others, that you're sort of like very happy with the fiscal reduction, with the way that the collections respond. I mean, again, this is going to be tailored probably. So maybe this is a bit of a um, 
a useless question, but I'm just curious if there are some that are sort of your, your go-to strategy for your particular institutions. I would say the one thing that comes to, when you put it that way, if you want three arguments for what, um, what we want with light reduction, you know, motion detectors or, you know, um, occupancy sensors, or drapes over objects or whatever, but less light on an object is good for the object, less light in the room is good for the light bulbs to last longer and less light in the building uses less energy. And so, you know, that's a super easy example. Um, that's very interesting, yeah. Yeah, but but in HVAC, it's, 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 more, it's way more complicated. Yeah. Um, did you have anything else, Nancy, that you wanted to add? I, I think that, you know, again, being that we're semi-seasonal, um, we went year round in just a, several buildings, only the buildings that um, really can be open and humidified in the winter. Mm -hmm. uh, we did that several years ago, but by and large, the museum is closed for between um, mid-October to mid-May. I personally really love that the buildings are are given the opportunity when they can to go cold because that also helps us with our integrated pest management. <laughs> it, it does it does seem to we seem to have less pest activity um, when we've had hard winters. Um, unfortunately, we're having fewer and fewer of those, but um, I think that has been um, my favorite way of reducing costs and having a benefit for the collection. Yeah, that's. Very good point. How like integrated all of these things are never ceases to amaze me. Um, and that actually goes back to another question that um, I wanted to ask, which is how does this intersect with other forms of sustainability initiatives that you might have going on? Nancy, you mentioned the solar panel fields um, and yeah, and the pest management. So I'm curious if um, maybe starting with you, since you had mentioned that we could talk a little bit about, um, you know, water usage and all of these other, I know this is really focused on energy, but um, it does seem like it's impossible to really to just talk about one without talking about the others. So uh, if you could both speak to that, that would be really neat. Um, well, I think, so other other initiatives we have ongoing at the museum are um, wastewater runoff. Um, we do have um, some ground source heat pumps that are used in, as, um, in some of our buildings and um, we have runoff retention ponds um, that kind of look like art features on the landscape, but they actually have a purpose um, in the um, um, for our for our operation. Um, I, that's the only thing that comes to mind quickly. When you mentioned the solar panels, I think when we spoke before, you had said that that was a company that had come to you. Oh, right. So oh, yes, yeah. yeah. So in fact, the 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 solar panels that are on the museum's land, um, we we had fifty acres that we weren't really using. It was a, a field that, um, you know, is is not. It's across some railroad tracks from the museum proper, and a company off and on over the years, um, the museum had considered solar but a company came to us and effectively we're leasing the land so it's it's getting some benefit from something we weren't really using um and and we get a portion uh we get the credits from a portion of the energy that's generated from that solar field and we will have the option of buying those panels um at, at some point at a reduced cost um so again it's it's being creative with what assets you have um but again i i don't know if, I don't know if we would have done that um, if the company hadn't come to us. I guess one thing that comes to mind for me, we have started putting um, film on our windows, even on historic glass. And it um, not only is UV blocking, it's it's almost clear. It's, it's clear enough that our um, historic appearance is not affected, but it blocks IR as well. And so in the summertime that I, I don't have a way of measuring it, um, the savings I, you know, we had, I, but it's, it, that was a, an easy thing for us. We, Virginia doesn't tend to have the state support that Vermont offers for energy savings for various reasons. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, we have to really look hard at payback period and all of that with this kind of stuff. But but this film, window film, has actually turned out to be a real boon. Um, and, you know, we definitely see less heat buildup in these spaces uh, and our summers are are getting even longer. <laughs> so. That's really interesting. Yeah. That, our, the creek that runs through Colonial Williamsburg is chill water runoff. And that is is well water. So it's it's also incorporated as a feature. But I think that's something that we're going to be curbing over the next few years um, because it does require a lot of, uh, you know, when these things were put in, water was cheap and abundant in Virginia. And, and it still is um, in comparison to the rest of the country, but it's just not the right thing to do. Right. Oh. Um, we had a, one follow-up question in the chat here about which uh, window films you're using to reduce IR. Do you happen to know the name off the top of your head? I don't. Um, yeah. And uh, there, there was a lot um, in the um, Washington, uh, the Western concert W. Western. Oh, now Whack. my brain. W A C. Western. Regional yeah, whack. Group, right? whack. Okay, there it is. <laughs> there were there were some good articles written about window films uh, several years back, and and um, you know, and they talk about grayscale, and and it's very particular to each. I know Winter was able to put on a film that was gray because Dupont did it. Um, you know, we have to make it look like it's not there. So um, you know, there there's more to it than just you know one brand's the best. It's it's more shopping for what you require and, and what meets your needs but Thank you. all yeah. right yeah I think I think that that is it the balance of the aesthetic <laughs> with um with the uh, the benefit to the collection um I think we because our by and large our historic buildings are not um historic interiors they're they're gallery spaces mm -hmm. we've been able to use um tinted interior storms mm -hmm. a lot um so you know, the, the view from the outside is that the, the windows look dark mm -hmm. and that's just fine. But increasingly our, our public is wanting to have the windows opened up and um, so that they can see out and, and get a sense of where they are in the landscape. And so that's some, that's a challenge that um, I'm also thinking about right now. Yeah. Um, we got a question. I'm going to kind of turn to the questions because the Q&A is popping off now. So thank you all for um, throwing questions in the chat. Um, and this is something that I actually had on our list of things to talk about. So one of the issues that comes up again and again with discussing environmental controls is the issue of loans and the um, problem getting loans if you don't sort of prove your uh, environmental controls are extremely, extremely tight. Oftentimes, as institutions, we require tighter controls for loaned objects than we have, than we maintain in our own institutions. So um a question for you both is, you know, what do you, how do you handle loans? Do you only, um, you know, ask for loans in areas that are, that do have tight controls or, you know, is this something that you've been able to negotiate with lenders? I think this is a, this is going to be a bigger conversation for our entire field, but I'm curious how, with the experience that you both have, how you've handled that. Uh, let's start with you, Patty. Um, so, Typically, if we're borrowing something, it's going into our museum building. And, you know, that is, uh, it's, you know, it was built with lots of insulation. It was built with hardly any windows. It's a, it's a, it's, it's still a monster, but it, it is very, it's, it's efficient in that category of building. Um, and, and, you know, so that's where our generally where loans go. Um, when we are lending, um, you know, I see, I see a lot of facility reports that I can tell have just been written with what they want you to hear. And, you know, you, you know, when you, when you look at the charts, it's different, but um, you know, so we do consider whether something is tested or not. I can say we hardly ever refuse a loan, even with that, because we also include that argument. What's in it for us? You know, is it good for us to be seen at this museum? Is it good for us to share with others? Is it good for our collection to get out there and dance in front of other people? And, you know, we generally will take those risks and don't consider them to be significant. It's It's been years since we've even done a microclimate. And our Curators do not like the idea of glazing paintings, which I think 
you know, that serves a lot to help an object in a new and different environment. Yeah, and I mean, for us, we also have a specific building where loans typically go into, um, specifically from institutions. Um, that building was designed, I think, in 20. 10 and um, open to the public in 2013. And so the, the gallery spaces are stacked on top of each other. And then the rest of the building does not have the same level of climate control as the gallery spaces. Um, we, and as Patty said, similarly, I will look at um, what kind of environment the requested object is currently in, and then see how that lines up with the, um, the requester. And oftentimes, if it's coming from a storage area, you know, that does not have that high level climate control, then it can basically just go about anywhere. <laughs> that is really neat and really opens up. I feel like it kind of opens up a lot of opportunity in a lot of ways um, for showing collections. I, I'm curious if those loan requirements weren't in place, do you think, and maybe this is a bit of a hypothetical that's unfair to ask, but do you think that there would be more of a desire um, to put objects in less carefully controlled environments um, if that was sort of more of an option? Uh, do either of you have thoughts on I that? I think it's like the buildings. You have to look at each loan, each environment, each object, and, you know, and decide. And, um you have to just include, you know, the whole package with that. That's a very sensible answer. I mean, <laughs> Nancy, did you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I think it's a, it's an interesting conversation specifically when so many institutions who have historic or period um, ha uh, rooms are looking at um, contemporary interventions into those spaces and working with artists, contemporary artists who are placing their items into a space that doesn't have the typical um, environment that that I think leads to increased conversation. I, I've never seen that an artist has turned away because an environment is not like a museum, um, but, you know, we, we do have the conversation about that. And, you know, it also leads to what, what kind of care, those kinds of questions that you know, what, what would they, they like to see and when, when, how much, how much can they tolerate in mm -hmm. terms of, um, you know, a variance. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, all right. I'm going to turn to a couple more questions. Um, we have one from James who says, I'm a facilities manager with a background in children's museums. The first year with managing a 30,000 square foot collection has been interesting. That's <laughs> off to you. Um, what authorities uh, could bring our collections folks to help them be more open to more tolerance on temperature and humidity? I spend a fortune keeping things at um, 70 degrees and 50% RH in Virginia year round. That's a super great question. Um, I think AIC probably has a big role to play in this, which is part of why we want to have this conversation. Um, so yes, do either of you have uh, thoughts for James on other authorities uh, that could speak to that? <laughs> Yourselves, perhaps? <laughs> I am not sure where we are right now with the AIC wiki on environmental recommendations. I mean, there there is ASHRAE, um, you know, that that does say these things, you know, that depending on what you've got, this is the kind of building you might want. If you already have equipment, though, that was designed to do that, just opening up your set points will not you know, just getting, um, you know, your internal authorities to approve widening set points doesn't set change, doesn't save you energy necessarily. It can make the equipment go kind of bonkers and, and, and waste energy. So you, you have to approach it in an experimental fashion and, and just check out what you're doing as you're doing it and see what happens. Um, you know, we've just found that it, it, in some cases it bounces all over the place because the equipment was designed for temperature control, not for RH control. And the programming is, as you probably know, is really complicated. Um, so you, you have to have, those are the, I would, I would start 
probably with with some engineers to look at what happens you know what do you see as being the way to to broaden this with with a with a large building like that that's probably what where i would start is with with a contractor or a, or an engineer that understands programming of the equipment and and including your collections folks in those conversations too so that there's transparency and um, understanding on all levels you know i think um, that that is a challenge. That is an ongoing challenge. There's a constant need for education for all staff members about these these um, sort of wider bands and and whether or not they're appropriate for a, a given collection. Yeah, those are great points. Thank you. Um, we've also got another um, point in the chat that uh, the IPI, the Image Permitting wait, Image Permanence Institute, I think that's it, right, uh, in Rochester, New York, has good resources on reducing energy usage. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, we would definitely encourage folks to look at their resources. They're amazing. Um, oh, and Amy kindly put that right in the chat. Thank you, Amy. Um, and we sort of touched on this, so I'm going to go to Monica's question. Um, could you talk a bit more about controlling only the humidity? How has your facilities department been able to do so in newer buildings designed with tall ceilings and so many glass windows? Um, do either of you we don't do that in newer buildings, you know? <laughs> do you, Nancy? Um, no, most of our newer buildings have no windows or we've done what we can to block out all light. <laughs> yeah. You know, Sounds we like do town, have, huh? though, in one building, the, the one that doesn't have air conditioning um, and it was vacant all through COVID, um, we set up just regular oscillating fans throughout the buildings that were plugged into humidistats. Whenever the humidity was over 50%, I think is what we, 45 or 50, the fans go on and move the air. And um, that really helped. We had one significant mold outbreak and, and then we implemented that. And, um, you know, and that was, that's just empirical. <laughs> we, we, we'd love more work on, on mold. Yeah, I and I agree. I'd love to see more work on mold and um, just the, the, moving air around and we've yeah. got a a, collect, a small collection of horse-drawn vehicles in a barn that mm -hmm. has no insulation no other no other means of controlling the environment um it's you know there's there's some um, a, a small difference between the outside environment and what's inside the barn but um rick did put some fans in there and those aren't connected to any kind of humidistat we just turn them on when the building lights go on and turn them off at night. Um, some There are days when um, the, the fans are going, um, even though we're not open to the public. Um, so we are exposing our, um, because the lights and the fans are on the same circuits, we're exposing those collection pieces to light that they wouldn't get normally. But um, you know when you're weighing the potential of fading versus um, the potential of mold growth. I'll, I'll take the fading over the mold right. growth for that particular collection. Um, and it's amazing. We really don't see mold in that building, even though the relative humidity in that building can be over 90% in summertime. Um, so I would love to see more work on the effect of ventilation. We, um, in Rick's um, paper that he did for the Getty Conservation Institute, it's still up on their thing. I think it's 2000 and, oh goodness. 2007. Um, it's part of their um, experts roundtable. He he actually goes into some detail about um, a storage area that is um, has is heat and ventilation to control the relative humidity, and and how that operates. And um, so that's um, louvers opening and closing. Um, we do have some oscillating fans in that space just to encourage air movement. Um, and then we've, because of climate change, we've had to add um, some a room size um, uh, dehumidifier that's plumb to the outside and um, you know goes on and off because it's got a humidistat in there. And that really, um, it's it's amazing how that one room size dehumidifier is um, takes off the the um, high the very highs um, that we have in that space. That's fascinating. I love. I'm a fan of a fan, so in my own house, so 
intrigued by that uh, concept of increasing ventilation. Um, we have a comment from an engineer in attendance. So thank you, uh, Nicola. She says, engineer here, we have, a, we have reduced our energy consumption dramatically without changing set points. Understanding the control algorithms is very useful, to Patty's point. Um, if you can find a contractor who will help you with this, it can also be valuable. Engineers like to talk, talk in jargon, so don't be afraid to challenge this and ask for clear explanations. I can appreciate that. So yeah, thank you for chiming in um, to, to help with that previous question. Um, we've got another anonymous attendee who is asking, what would you advise smaller museums to do if they are struggling to meet recommended RH bans, but are nervous to stop trying? It would be great if the larger organizations could publish their experience and trying um, wider RH targets. I think there are some publications on this uh, for sure out there, but um, is there any, are there any particular ones that you would, you would point this attendee to um, or any particular bits of wisdom that you could share on that point? We perhaps need to um, put together a group of uh, publications that would talk about this. Um, that might be something that we could do as the committee to kind of share a little bit. Mm -hmm. But um, I think personally, I hope that um, smaller institutions will be able to benefit from some of these conversations. And um, I know um, some colleagues who work more in the regional sphere and talk to a lot of smaller museums have reported that there's you know, a lot of stress and anxiety that goes into meeting these really, really tight set points. And as we're having this conversation and others, I think it's quite clear that, um, you know, as Patty mentioned earlier, perhaps light is, is an important thing to target uh, as well. And that might be more feasible. So one um, of the things that's helped me in that, um, just in talking to my engineers and facilities managers about, um, you know, they, they were worried about humidifying more in the winter. And I've really gotten them to be okay with in some cases, we don't even turn on our humidifiers except for maybe one month in the winter. It takes so long to dry a structure out and to, you know, so we we kind of stay at that 55 all summer long, really flat. And then it takes, we we kind of wait until we see that it's that it's starting to, you know, bump into the 30s. And then we might start um you know, two weeks later, turn on the humidifier, but we're we're turning our humidifying boilers, the steam boilers off completely in buildings for the summer, because I realized that it was trying to tweak it, you know, it might go down to 45. And, you know, that it was, why are we running this whole boiler just in case we need that little tiny bit, telling them it's okay to dip down to 35. And you know it'll it'll come right back. I mean, we still outside in Virginia, we still see 100% humidity daily. You know, there is no two ways about it. But you know, and and we're not getting that cold hardly. So that's that's great advice. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Um, and uh, Leanne says, thank you, Patty, for mentioning the relevance of what the equipment was made to handle. That's important for me too. I didn't realize uh, thinking about that is, is such an essential bit of this. Um, we have another question from an anonymous attendee regarding new buildings. Have either of you been involved in discussions when buildings were being planned? What should be considered in regards to collection spaces and galleries and energy consumptions other than no, or energy consumption, excuse me, other than no windows? If we were starting from scratch, what would we say? <laughs> I've been experience. involved with several new buildings. Um, and uh, first of all, you know, that's a really great thing in our field to be invited. And the, <laughs> the biggest thing that I feel I can do for my colleagues, including like my vice president, is I am not afraid to ask the dumbest questions at the meetings. You know, please explain this to me. I don't understand. And you will realize that three quarters of the room doesn't understand. And they're very happy for you to be that person that will bridge that divide. Um, so, you know, it is about learning the language of the people that you're working with. Um, but also it, the engineers that are coming in from outside and working with you to design this, they hear a number and they're going to give it to you. They, they are not looking at ranges, flexi, you know, um, bands. 
they they are coming in assuming that you're asking for a number and that's what you want and so the it's a conversation that has to continue you know you might say what if i told you i wanted that 40 degrees was okay but i don't want it 40 degrees you know all the time i i kind of need that little extra oomph every so often so we average through the year you know those those kinds of conversations give them a better vision of what you're looking for rather than you know they would love it if you just say 50 and 72 and they'll do their darndest to give it to you and you want to say does that cost 10 or does that cost six you know and and how do we get closer to the six and still stay within um but fantastic well we're getting close on time here so i'm just gonna throw a few more questions at you um a lot of these comments are really helpful um folks uh writing in from arizona laughing about 100 percent humidity <laughs> so um we have a question from a museum conservator in Northern Norway. What can I do if our ventilation system is being replaced and will be turned off in the galleries? Oops, sorry, that just moved. Uh, for a month, do we need to put in place dehumidifiers or is this an opportunity for a shutdown experiment, I suppose? Um, <laughs> yeah, so maybe just monitoring quite closely and, and watching it. Yep. Yeah, sounds like, so you could read a little bit about shutdowns uh, perhaps. Not to answer the question, but sorry if either of you had anything else to add, please. Offer. Our best shutdown experiments are always when we lose power and, you know, we've lost power <laughs> for a week and we've learned that we can hold our RH in our storage spaces for a week in the winter without any energy input at all. All of those things are the things that you show to your facilities guys to say this is okay. And in fact, if one piece of equipment breaks, we no longer leave the air handlers running to move the air because that that just blows everything right out of the water. Everybody knows you shut the building, you keep it closed and don't let anybody in or out and you turn everything off. So mm -hmm. shutdown experiments, that, that's, a, I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah, so we should all be thinking about sort of making good use of, mm -hmm. you know, other life events like having to shut things down. But that's great. And dehumidifiers, especially if they're not plumbed, as Nancy said, to plumbing to go out or to to a drain or to outside can um, cause more harm than good because they often fail and overfill. Mm, OK, that's good to know. So be aware. <laughs> Um, touching on the topics of fans, I'm a facilities person at a relatively modern museum in the upper Midwest with rooms that are overly large and high ceilinged for our current use plan. Do you have any advice on reducing ceiling height or modifying overly large spaces with installed fans to reduce energy needs? Does anyone, I don't know that either of your spaces would really have spoken to that, but um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't think that we've done any sort of um, real study on uh, the, the fans in the round barn, but certainly I don't know how tall that structure is, but it's se several stories high. Um, it's a very large space. And um, I know I know Rick worked with a an engineer to calculate how much air movement was necessary um, to to do the installation and then tested it out. Yeah, de we find that de de-stratifying air in tall spaces is very useful. You know, you just you want it to be homogenized, and and um, that you get. You know, we use a stack effect to its advantage, and then we try to reduce it when it's not an advantage. So you do want to. I I think that fans are great. <laughs> Super. All right, we've got about I think time for one or two more. Um, we have a question which I think is very interesting uh, from Eric. Have you tried to measure dimensional changes or material movement on complex objects? Um, or are you relying on visual observations to indicate whether there's change in objects? How do both of you approach this? I know you both have insanely large collections for the number of personnel. So what would be your advice uh, for Eric on that front? We're using visual, I mean, you know, we're measuring cracks, um, but, and that's mostly because of the facilities that we have, um, you know, we, we have used crack monitors and, and things to, to see things move, but, but we're not doing any, you know, controlled experiments or any of that within our, our labs. That's a big undertaking. Nancy, did you have anything further to add? Okay, great. Yeah. 
There's uh, been some really good um, papers written on that, though, that I've I've seen where people are doing that. Hmm. All right. So there are a couple other things. Lorraine is um, chiming in that the AIC PMG on Friday, uh, the meeting, which I think you can still join virtually, uh, there's going to be a presentation on uh, building an environmentally sensitive SF MoMA, um, which is a pre recorded presentation. So that should have some discussions of reducing energy in a new building uh, and how energy could be saved. So, yes, please tune in. We're presenting, a couple of us, Lorraine and I, are both presenting on sustainability uh, there too. Um, I think one last question to wrap it up and then we'll be right at time. Um, what is your advice for people who are, you know, wanting to starting to implement these changes? Are there, is there any kind of one bit of um, wisdom or sort of guidance that you would give uh, to end on? Let's start with you, Nancy. I, I think get to know your facilities people, get to know them as people um, and understand where their challenges are. Um, before you get into a conversation about making any changes. I think that's the most important thing. That's a great bit of advice. Patty, do you have anything to add? Oh, I I, I, I think Nancy hit it right on. Um, if you look at the IPI resources, one of the first things they do is um, list who should be present. And you want, you also want an administrator to you know the money person, the 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 guy that pays the bills to be there so that they you know understand what you're after, um, and you, you know all the deciders should be there and and speaking with 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 one voice by the end of your your conversations. Fantastic. All right. Well, that's a great bit of advice. I need to take that and take that to heart. <laughs> um, I think there's still a lot of uh, stuff in the chat, so feel free to peruse everyone. But uh, I think we will wrap it up since it is definitely uh, been an hour and we don't want to take any more of our uh, generous speakers time. So thank you all for attending. Thanks for the wonderful questions. Um, we will keep this conversation going in a lot of different forms. And those of you who are in attendance today, please do attend uh, the other events as well and keep those fantastic questions coming. So thanks again, uh, Nancy and Patty, for your time. Uh, and thanks to AIC for hosting this. So, all right. Take care, everyone. Thank you.